exciting new day. Let's uh, stand and worship. family and guests. What a wonderful day it is to be in the house of the Lord with all of you. Um, Sunday is so special because the devil, the evil one, the world, our flesh, we've been fighting that all week. And it's been used against us to keep us from worshiping today. Satan has done everything he could do to keep you from worshiping God today. And, but that's all he can do. All he can do is attack us. All he can do is ridicule us and afflict us. But we chose to be here today to worship and serve our one true God. And so today is just a blessing simply because it's the Lord's day and we are in his house today. So with that, please follow me in prayer as we honor God and seek his leadership this morning. And almighty God and Father in heaven, we thank you so much, Lord, for everything that we have in you and everything that you are. Lord, what's so special about you is that you are love. 
Lord, you don't just have love, you are love. And you are faithful with this love. You are faithful in your word and in your character. These things will never change. We'll never have to worry about you never loving us. You, we never have to worry about you changing your mind about us. We never have to worry about the, you changing your mind about the promises that you have given to us. We can stand upon these promises and we can stand upon our faith in you because you are faithful. And we're so thankful, Lord, that even though where you are, it's perfect. You're being worshipped by angels. You're being worshipped by the saints in heaven. And everything about you and around you speaks of your majesty. But Father, your heart is focused on us. Your heart is toward us. Those who are so unworthy of you. Those who fail you, yet you never fail. So Lord, with that, we honor you today. And with everything that we are, we worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we just want to say thank you that you love us and that your love is perfect. And we want to exalt your name, Lord, and we want to focus on one person, and that is our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, because it's through him that all things are possible. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Treasure. 
Father, we praise you for you are good, for you are worthy. Lord, we just ask that you would speak to us through your word, through your spirit. God, there's so much that happens day in and day out. And Lord, I know for so many, we look at the future, we look at tomorrow, and we wonder, what's it going to be? What's the world going to be like? And the only peace I find is that you are never changing. I may not know what tomorrow holds in this world, but I do know you, Father. You do not change, not to the left, not to the right. You don't become more gracious or less gracious. You just are gracious. You don't become more just or less just. You are justice. You don't become more our Father or less our Father. You're just our Father. So we can find peace and rest that we serve a good, good Father. So Jesus, we lift your name high this morning. Above every other name, above every system, above everything, every doubt, every worry, every pain, every hurt, we lay them down at the cross. We trade yokes with you. We will give you our yoke and we'll take on yours. So that right now, we can listen and be at peace. So it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. You all may be seated. Welcome to another family service. Again, there is no interruption with your kiddos. Whatever you need to do to make today work, go for it. Right? We are here as a church family, but also with the little ones, and it is not a bother. I guarantee you when Jesus said, let the little ones come to me, and all the disciples were saying, get them out of here, it wasn't because they were all sitting there doing exactly what they needed to do. Right? He says, let them come here because I care about them. So whatever it takes. If you want to open up your Bibles, phones, tablets to Romans chapter 12, that's where we're going to start today, Romans chapter 12. Today we're going to talk about how do I get ready for this next school year? As parents, as kids, you're like, hey, wait a minute, that doesn't apply to me. Then I'm going to say, how do you get ready for this next work year? It applies to you too. Right? We all have something that God has tasked us with. We may love it, we may not love it, but God has given it to us nonetheless. And so it's hard to navigate the waters of today. You know, how do I do this? How do I do that? What do I choose? What don't I choose? And so just to give a little bit of an illustration, I heard this story, and I thought, it was, I thought it would help us this morning. And so in the Atlantic Ocean, there's over the, the intercoms and the radios, and they hear the, this is the USS Montana. We see a vessel that's ahead of us. We need you to move 15 degrees north. And they hear back on the radio, Ksh. well, we request that you move your vessel 15 degrees south. This was a strange accent to them. And so they said, no, we are the USS Montana. You need to move. And they said, no, I think you're the ones that need to move. And then the admiral, the, the captain of the ship comes and he says, we are the USS Montana. We are the second largest vessel in the Atlantic we will defend ourselves. Move your vessel 15 degrees north. Silence. We're a lighthouse, mate. You make the call. Right? We're a lighthouse. We ain't moving anywhere. Right? And I say that they could have started the conversation with, we're a lighthouse. So we, as Christians, can choose to be an obstinate lighthouse or a helpful one. Right? A good lighthouse shines in the darkness. Let's... It saves ships. The opposite lighthouse is like, look, I'm here. God brought me here, but I sure don't want to be here. Right? Either way, our lights will shine one way or the other. 
So let's look at this in Romans chapter 12, starting at verse 9. It says, Let your love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. And love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and to seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly and never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by the doing so, you will heap burning coals on their head. Do not, overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So, for all of us trying to navigate these waters, going to work, Having a house, walking in the world we live in, is the best thing that we can do is just stay away from what is evil. Now, that's very easy, you know, that's an easy mental exercise, but it's incredibly difficult practically, right? Especially if you're in the workforce, most likely you are not in a Christian sphere. Many of our students, they're not in a Christian sphere when they go to school, right? So this can be a tough thing. We stay away from what is evil and we love what is good. To quote the philosophical show, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, right? How, how did he handle that, right? What does it say in the song? There was a couple of guys that were up to no good, right? Started making trouble in my neighborhood, right? And so that's why they had to leave. Look, we all know those people in our lives who are trouble, right? We know who they are at work. We know who they are at school. Now, we stay away from them, yes. But then here comes the question is, then who reaches these people with the gospel, Right? The scripture even says bad company will corrupt good morals. So here's the difference. It's not that I can do nothing with this person. It's I don't go to bad places with bad people. I can invite bad people to good places. Right? Where I am not the minority of the light. Right? We can have, other, have them around other Christians, other positive things. And if they're like, no, nah, I don't want to be around you, that's not on me. That's not on me. I've done what I can, but I cannot go with you into your darkness. I can sit, I can have, we can, we can have food, right? And again, and we'll, we'll see that here in a little bit later. But this idea, right, I can, I can be friendly and even be friends, but I can't let them speak that darkness into my life. That's the line that's got to get drawn, right? Like, you're not my confidant if you are not going to be the one leading me to the Lord. You're not going to be the one I share my innermost being with if you're not going to lead me to the Lord. And when you want to go to those dark places, I say, hey, I love you. You know where I'll be, but I'm not going with you. So then it says, love one another with brotherly affection. So we find Christians where we go, right? That's one of the goals is who else believes like me? Now, we live in a world where you may not find somebody. That's why church is so important, right? We try to connect as best we can. Right? We, where we work, where we go to church, where we go to school, where we play. We look for those other believers as well as being evangelistic. But one of the things he's saying is, when you see another believer, outdo one another in showing honor. Look, a lot of us get beat down day in and day out. Either from work, from relationships, from life, from just the person we are inside. Right? Some of us, the person we wrestle with most is the person we see in the mirror. We don't need other people to harp on us and beat us down. That is not the role of the church. Most people are beat down enough already. Right? We, you know, we, we, as a youth pastor for 10 years, I kept being told of these kids who are just so entitled and they think they're the greatest thing since sliced bread. And I was like, I don't know which kids you talk about. I haven't met one yet. I know they're out there and I'm sure they're, they exist. But the ones who were coming to church had such little hope, had such little self-esteem. 
This idea that I have to earn everything in this world. I have to choose my own identity. And what if I'm wrong? This existential weight. We as believers can help encourage that even in our young ones. And to do that, we must be fervent in spirit. We don't just need to give our earthly wisdom. Let's give spiritual wisdom. Fan the flame of the gospel in your heart. Because the world is trying to snuff it out. The world will not help you grow in your fervor for the Lord. I guarantee it. Right? All it's trying to do is blow your little light out. Well, too bad. My God sent his only begotten son to die for me. And when it wants to blow and blow and blow, I have to remind myself that for me to be saved, for me to be called, there was a price. And I was not worthy of that. And so when it wants to come and he wants to blow your light out, say, not today, Satan. Not today. Fan that flame inside yourself. And here's the hard part. You may find, ah, I found a Christian at work. I found a Christian at school. And they're the ones trying to blow your fire out. Right? We've all had that, especially going to school. I went to a private school. Then I went to Texas State, which if there's conservative private school, this is like as far that direction of a private school as you could go. Right? They changed their name because they tried to drop the party school moniker. They just should have also dropped being a party school. They did not do that. They just changed the name. Right? And so you're at this place that's constantly trying to drag you down. And then you see Christians come and they're just mean and mean mean spirited. And you're like, man, this isn't helping. This isn't helping the cause. We can choose who we will be. And if we, are, if we have a tendency to be that person, this verse helps us. It gives us a, to encourage one another, to rejoice in hope. Parents, spouses, I cannot say this enough. Aunts, uncles, workers, co-workers, grandparents, sons, daughters, whatever your role in life is, this world is doing everything it can to take the hope away from people. That is the number one thing I saw as a youth pastor. Very few kids had hope. Very few. And I'll address that a little more as we go on. But be a dealer of hope in your life. Encourage them. Encourage others. Lead them. Let them talk and share the things that they struggle with. If you can't be the safe place for them to share their struggles, they'll find somebody else. And that may not be the person you want them talking to. Right? We have this weird thing. We go to our peers for advice. As if somebody my age with my experience knows more than I do. Right? And sometimes... There, there, we have some old souls. We have some wise people. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. I'm not saying there's not wise people. But even as a pastor, when I'm like, I'm really struggling, I call older pastors who've been through it. Right? I have mentors who's like, man, how, how did you walk through this? And it's never, well, I don't know. I've never been through that. Let me, which time is usually what they say. Right? What do you want me to hear? Because we all go through things. So be a dealer of hope. Be patient in tribulation. Everyone's watching how you handle hardship. Little eyes, co-workers, everybody's watching. How do you handle the toughness at work? How do you handle the toughness at school? One of the best things we can do, and one of the most Christ-like things we can do, is suffer like Jesus. I know that's not the most exciting verse. That's not the Tim Tebow under the eyes going into the football game. But it's true. One of the best things we can do is suffer like Jesus. And how do I make it through this? We be constant in prayer. We pray and we pray and we pray. Then that helps us with all the other parts. To show hospitality. To help the saints. So here's my thing to a student. This is back to school Sunday. If any of our students, college, younger, if you need help with a subject, please let the church know. If you are good at helping in subjects, be brave and let the church know. Please don't be too busy to help somebody younger than you make it through school. Amen. Now, um, I'm going to go ahead and say you do not want me doing your math. Okay, let's just throw that right out there. They're just straight out, you will do, look, every little one under, under my hips can do better than me at that, okay? Like, that is so not my gifting, that is not my subject. I will help you, 
do worse. So don't do that, right? So, right, but I have things I can't help with. And there's a lot of people here who are great at certain subjects, and together we can all make our way through it. Amen? That's why there's a church. Right? And then it says to live humbly. Look, even if they're your top of your industry, top of your class, walk humbly with God and with others. There should be nobody too low for you to associate with. I get it. Not everyone's going to quote-unquote click. But that's not what makes me close to you as a Christian. It's our faith. Look, you can go to a church and have nothing in common with anybody with hobbies. Because that's the way the world works, right? We find people with similar hobbies, and we hang out with people we have fun with. The problem is when things get tough, that's where that fun ends. When our uniting is in Christ, we could have different ethnic backgrounds, different ages. And I'm learning from people constantly. I just did church plan assessments a couple weeks ago. The gentleman who scored the highest, and I can't say who it was or where anything like that, was a 67-year-old African-American man. He had been in ministry self-taught for 40 years. Helped 300 people get off the street, get off addiction, and go to school, get a job, get a life. And he was a sponge. That man was trying to learn everything he could during assessment weekend. It was amazing. I was inspired. I was like, man, I want to be like him when I'm 67. Right? This man's learning and learning and learning. He could have walked in and said, I know it all. I just need your money. Well, I had somebody say that. Instead, he said, what can I learn? Where can I grow? That's the posture we have. We live humbly and we associate with each other because God's brought us together. Right? And then it says, to repay no one evil for evil, but do what is honorable in the sight of all. So, the way we work at work, at home, at school, really matters. Am I known as the lazy one or am I known as the hardworking one? Am I known as the, oh, don't talk to them, they're having a bad day one? Am I the cantankerous one? Am I the bully? Am I the cheat? Am I the gossiper? Like, you all know who that person feels in your office if you have them, Right? We have to be people above reproach to do what is honorable, right? And I'm not saying, especially like in the context of kids, you're just letting somebody put hands on you. That's not what we're saying here, right? You need to work that with your family, what that looks like. But we need to be honorable people, especially at work, especially at school. We should be seen as the hard workers. That was actually one of the things in the first century that helped Christianity spread like it did is the Roman soldiers who were Christians were the best soldiers in the army. The merchants who were Christians were the only people who dealt fairly with people. And people were like, man, I love these Christians because when I interact with them, I know they're not trying to cheat me. I know they're trying to get one up on me. So we have to deal with ourselves honorably. As far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. If, you're hungry, if your enemy is hungry, you feed them. That's hard. But that's the scripture. Do not overcome evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. And if you want your little ones to live this way, they will only do that when they see you do it. Look, there's things in my son that I have to parent out of him that are straight me. Like, he learned that from me. It looks like me. It sounds like me. And I was like, oh, no. I got to parent me out of my son sometimes. And he'll call me on it. He did this to me just a few weeks ago. He said, but Dada, you do it too. And I said, I know, son. And I'm so sorry. So you call me when I do it too. But, but I said, son, my goal is not to make you like me. I'm your father, and I'm to make you a better man than I. I want you to be a better man than I am. So i got to do this. And it's hard for both of us. And you know what? Your dad is wrong sometimes. And it's hard but it's true. So use wisdom and prudence who you keep close, but do your best to be at peace with everyone. And look, somebody's not going to like you. The scripture says, woe if everyone speaks well of you. Right? If that evil person who like doesn't just get on your nerve, but tap dance on your reserve nerve, right, keeps doing that to you over and over again, you're probably doing something right. If that person loves you, I'm not saying it's impossible. 
just search your heart and figure out why. Perhaps God has really used you in someone's life or the opposite. I'm not saying one way or the other, just for you to know with the Lord. I want us to press on to go to another verse because these are practical things of how do I live in the marketplace and things like that. But I want us to take the spiritual side of it too. So if you'll turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 11. And we're going to try and close a little early. I'm going to spend about 10 minutes here. Close a little early so we can pray for everybody. As we go into our workplaces, especially the young ones as they're going into school. We have a lot of families out sick today, and so we're not going to forget them. They're all digitally. Guess what? The Holy Spirit can reach them too. But here's what the scripture says. I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory of what will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being an example to the flock. So when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded and be watchful. For your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith. Knowing the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So for you as adults, aunts, uncles, parents, grandparents, teachers, for you who are students, this was written to elders. This is written to leaders of the church. But this applies to all of us. And I think it's a beautiful picture that I need to shepherd what God has given me. If you are at home, the scripture says that you are a royal priesthood. I'm not the priest of your home. You as parents are. He's the high priest. He's the one who gets to call those shots. But you have to ask yourself, am I conducting myself in a way that what it says, am I doing what I'm doing under compulsion or not? Do I do it eagerly? Ooh, that could be tough. Especially when it comes to work. You're like, no, I hate this and I do this under compulsion. Absolutely. But I want to challenge you. Can you change that view for just a moment? Can you find a perspective once you say, you know what, God's given me this. And how do I do this eagerly? Parenting can be hard. Can you find a way to say, I know it's hard today, but I need to do it eagerly for those underneath me. Or like, You've been called to your family. And students, this is true for you. When you go to school, when you go to college, when you do any of those things, when we go to work, you've been called to that. And I get it. Nobody's like, oh, I cannot wait to be back at school. I'm sure they're out there. I was never one of them, right? I counted the hours of summer, right? Like, I do not want to go back. But you know what? If I can do it eagerly, that sure makes the school year a lot easier. And then it says not domineering. And that includes us as parents. We set boundaries. We enforce those boundaries. But none of us are called to be the tyrant of our home or our workplace, We're not called to be a tie-in of our home, workplace, or job, or your school, right? God doesn't do that with us, so we should not do that with those around us. Instead, we are to be an example, be an example of what to do. And here's the truth. Yes, I have to tell my son, hey, I know Dada does it too, but he's going to be at some point where he says, well, then I don't care because I don't see you do it. We have to live up to the standards we set. Because then it says, you who are younger, subject yourselves to the others, the elders. And that's the thing is we all need somebody over us. And when it says elders, that doesn't just mean in like age. That means in wisdom and in spiritual life. I've learned a lot from people younger than me. And here's the other truth. I hear people say this all the time. Well, I'm not a pastor. 
I don't really have anything to contribute. Like, why would anybody listen to me? You don't need to listen to me. Are you kidding me? You have the spirit of the living God in you. God has called us to be a church all together. The church is not the preaching ministry of Dustin Wooten. I could go do that by myself. A church is every single one of you. And the value you bring and the spirit of God you bring. And we are all in this together. And so when you look at discipleship, no one is too young to disciple somebody. If I'm a believer in Christ, you know what the requirement is? To be one step further than the person behind me. I will not have all the answers. I may have no answers. But I can say, let's get up and go. Let's, let's bring each other closer to the Lord. Let's learn together. Because it says, God opposes the proud and he gives grace to the humble. Folks, if I know everything, God's not going to be able to use that. If I believe there's nothing left to be taught, then God says, then you've got it. He opposes the proud. His biggest way of opposing the proud is to say, you know what? You got it. You want to be God of your life? Go be God. And he punishes us in some of the worst ways by giving us exactly what we asked for. But there's moments I will have found myself in calamity and I shake my fist at God and God's like, I didn't send you there. Nowhere in my plan or instructions did I tell you to go there. You went there because of your pride. You went there because you knew best. So I'll let you run it. Will you come to me? And that's why it says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. So here's the hard part. Kiddos, if you listen to me for a moment, your parents are going to fall short. Parents, here's the hard part. Your kiddos are going to fall short. So we all have to have grace. We need grace with each other. It's not one direction. Kids, this may surprise you, but when you were born, the doctor did not hand them an instruction manual about you. They were not handed a manual that said, this is what your child's going to be. This is going to be their temperament. This is going to be their likes and dislikes. This is going to be the best way to parent them. Instead, you were just given as a gift. And parents are doing their best. Sure, we could all do better. We can all do better. But we need grace both directions. Kids, you need to have some grace with your parents. But parents, you've got to have grace with your kids. You will snuff their hope out quickly if you're not gracious with your children. All of us humble ourselves on the mighty hand of God. Why? So that he may exalt you. That he will exalt you. So we work, we work hard, and we work into the Lord, but it is he who brings the exaltation. So when I do it for God, I'm never losing anything. I just say, God has a purpose. God has a plan. Ooh, well, God, your plan could probably pay a little more. I would really love if your plan had some more benefits packaged for me, please. But will God take care of me? Yes. And a lot of us who've been at rock bottom are here today. Because God exalted us. It says we can cast all of our anxieties on Him because He cares for us. It was one of the hardest things when I was working with students. Intense anxiety about the future. Us as adults... Intense anxiety about what are, what are our kids go? Can I afford college? Can I, you know, all the questions, right? Because here's the thing. We've been sold the American dream. And I've had kids who've really struggled in life with their anxiety and depression because of this concept, right? That I must go to school and I go to school to get good grades. And I get good grades to get good scholarships. And I get scholarships to go to good schools. And I get good, good schools to go to get a good job. And I get a good job so I can have a good family. And I have a good family so I can have a good retirement. So I can have a good death. Woo! Man, doesn't that sound like fun? No. And so, a lot of people think, oh, if I mess up at any one of these points, it's all ruined. It's all broken. Do you really think you're that powerful? Like, you really think that God wasn't like, oh, I can't believe they did that. And I'll say this for myself. He factored in my uh, obstinacy and stupidity into the plan. That was a part of the plan from the beginning. And were it not for God, 
I wouldn't be here. And I would challenge you, if you're somebody who struggles with anxiety and with hope, talk to someone older than you in this church and say, how did you make it? And I guarantee it wasn't, oh, well, it was just so easy. There ain't nobody in here who says, oh, it's just so easy. Life's a battle. Every day. Because we have this thing called sin in the flesh inside. And it wants to destroy everything we love. So we must be watchful. Because that's what the devil wants. And if you look at the context of the scripture, what does he want us to be? Right? The devouring is, of course, a generality, but it is specific. He wants us to be proud. He does not want us to be humble. He wants us to be self-sufficient. He wants me to be the leader of my life. That's what being devoured by the devil looks like in the context of this scripture. Is I do all the traits that this just told me not to. It's directed at elders, but it's true for all of us. We must stay firm in the faith. Look, we are all prey as sheep. So I'm going to put my faith in the Lion of Judah. That lion is much bigger, more powerful than the other. And he is mighty to save. So while we suffer for a little while, schoolwork, jobs, it don't last forever, folks. There is a light at the end of every tunnel. Even if it's heaven, that's the, the blessing of eternity. But the good news is you can experience that joy now. Jesus says, I came so that your joy may be full, so that you may live life and live it abundantly. And that has nothing to do with stuff that has to do with us being transformed. That means when all I have is mud pies, I can smile. I can get through it. That means when I'm at the low of the low points of my life, I have peace. I have joy. Right? Because he's the God of all grace. He's called us to eternal glory. So that's the good news. Eternity does not start when I die. It started the moment I became a Christian. But students, if you say that I'm a Christian, you are not the future of the church. You are the church. Down to the littlest one of you, if you say, I believe in Jesus, you are the church today. And God can do amazing things through each and every one of us. Because he who has called you will restore you. He can break, I mean, he can fix what is broken. He can restore us. He can confirm us. He can make sure that I know who I am and who I'm, what I'm made for. And that's an answer only he can answer. No society no test, no peer can tell me who and what I am. Only my creator can define my identity. He can strengthen us. He can pick you up and get us to move on and to fight back against the world that is encroaching on us. And he can establish us. He will set my feet firm so that I may live. Amen. Not he would or might. He will do these things in my life if I will live humbly under the mighty hand of God. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So we don't slack off. We give it our all. But do I do it so that God is glorified? Or do I just do it for me? When it comes down to is where's my faith? Where's my hope? And do I live in it? And do I really believe that God will be there on the other side of whatever comes next? That's how we find peace. I'm going to ask everybody to bow your heads and close your eyes as we, as we close. If you need to pray with somebody, we're going to have a prayer team up and be available. If something just, just register with you, like, I need to pray about my job, my family, my kids. If you're one of the kids, I'm going to ask that you pray with somebody. But Brother Keith, if you can start our music here. In just a moment, I would like for us to just pray for one another. So maybe you don't want to get up and pray with somebody. That's fine. But I am going to ask everybody who is willing to pray. If you're here with your family, I would ask that you just get together for just a moment and pray with your family. If you're like, hey, I don't have family to be around. I'm, I'm here by myself. Please go find somebody to sit and pray with or pray over. Don't do this by yourself. We all have loved ones who are in this world. And they need prayer. We may be in this world doing our best, but 
provide, make ends meet, and yet still uphold the name of Jesus, to stay sober, to push the vices away, you need prayer too. So I'm going to ask you to just take a few minutes, just a few minutes, pray over your family, pray for one another, and then we're going to come back and close by having all of our kiddos stand up, and we're going to pray over our kids as they go to school this year, so that they would know there's a church praying for them. Amen? So take a few minutes to pray. who couldn't be here with us, but your spirit touches them too. I know many of us have loved ones in this room in other states, in other places. We have co-workers. We have friends and family. And we just know somebody going through it. Lord, I pray that you would just be the Lord. And humble ourselves to help us to raise our children, to help us lead the children around us. Lord, that we would follow you and walk with you. God, that we'd help each other walk closer to you. And we would especially help these little ones. Lord, that's not the job of the children's ministry. It's their job as parents. It's not just the job of the children's ministry. It's our job as the church. That we would be a force of light and of hope in a world that wants to rip it away. But the world does not get to win. For we do not belong to it anymore. My name is written in the book of life in heaven, so I care not which book it's written in here on earth. Help us all to not be too busy to love and to care. And that includes myself. To help the disciple as you've called us to. I'm going to ask at this time if we have all of our all of our folks that are going to a school, homeschool, college, I don't care which school. If y'all will will come up here and join me please. Ask all of our and if you and look, if parents if you need to come up here with your littles, come up here with your littles. That's fine. We're not going to exempt you too. But we want all of our folks, college, young, first grade, kindergarten, pre-K, I don't care. That with shoes, without shoes, that's right. I want you all to come up here. And just know God has a huge plan for you today. God has called each and every one of you. Not one of you is a mistake. Not one of you is in deficit. The spirit of the living God has called you. And you can do great things today. You're not the future of the church. You are the church. And so I'm going to ask the rest of the church if you'll come and we're just going to pray over them. So that when you walk into your school, when you wake up in your home, when you encounter those around you and say, you know what, I, I don't know where to go, you can look around and know that there's people who love you. 
and know that your church prays for you and that you are valuable. You have an inherent worth and you're not just valuable to God, you're valuable to us. That all of you have something amazing to offer this world and don't let the world take it away from you. All right, let's pray over our students. If you want to pray out loud, pray out loud. Trust me, they'll hear me over the mic. But let's pray together. Lord, we do pray over each and every one of our students, be it college, masters, it doesn't matter. Lord, they are stepping into places that are dark. Lord, even if they're homeschooled, we're getting ready to send them into a world that doesn't belong to the devil anymore. It says that the world belongs to you in the fullness thereof. That we can walk confidently knowing that your spirit will lead and guide us. But help us not to be enticed by the things of this world. I pray that even for our littlest, for those who can barely talk or walk, God, that you would prepare the way for them. And Lord, help us as a church to not forget that this is not the job of a ministry. This is just the job of the church. And help each student to know they are loved and they are cared for and that you have a profound calling and plan for their life. And it started the moment you thought they would be born. From the moment we were conceived in your mind, there was purpose. And that yes, we may fall, we may fail, but that God, you pick us up again so that we may keep pressing on. We press on. We get a bad grade. Okay, we get back up and we strive for a better one. We're having a hard time making friends. That's okay. We pray to look for you, God, to give us community. We struggle with our own inadequacies and the things we don't like about ourselves. The anxieties, all the what ifs. Help us to trust you and you alone to bring us through to the other side so that we may build a beautiful life for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a blessed and wonderful week. We love you guys, and we'll see you this week. God bless.
Okay, there we go. There we go. Can you turn up just a little bit? Just a reminder, everybody, we have a fellowship at 4.30 at the Senior Center. So we'd love to see everybody there. There will be pizza, and if you're like, I don't want pizza, then it's potluck. Otherwise, it's pizza. So we'll see you there at 4.30.